enough of this. So this is Coffee Computer Club in my new my new uh, my new house. Um, so pardon my funny video appearance. Um, everything to do with compilers and several people who asked for invites aren't here and people sent me mails that I'll have to sort at some point that bounced. Um, compilers, language one times, garbage collection, typing systems, nil or not the nil. Um, you're being recorded. You'll show up on YouTube within a couple hours, hopefully, to see what my upstream bandwidth is. Mm -hmm. That's my spiel. I, I don't have, I'll, I'll do the, the AA update, although Max is probably more interested, um, or Aaron is, but he's not here, neither one. So basically I moved. Um, so I've been just starting to recode, uh, trying to get back into it on and off. I still have a lot of house to unpack, so it's going to be slow going for a while. Basically, when I need to take a day of rest, I'm back to coding and then I'm <laughs> unpacking again. <laughs> Uh, and Lisa and I are really enjoying the new place. So that, that's all I'm going to say on video. Does anyone else want to throw something out or I'll, I'll make up something here? Oh, I see the man, the guy who sent me the request gave me the wrong email address. So I will try again. Um, da, 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 da. So you guys can say something else if you don't want to wait on me. Yeah, I... I got some uh, questions, I guess. Um, I've been looking to pattern matching lately, uh, implementing that. And I, I sort of have it for cases where you can have a single pattern. So my, in my language, that's uh, lap bindings, where it's similar to say Rust. You don't just define a variable. Your quote unquote variable is an actual pattern. So you could do something like, oh, let sum, and then the variable in there equals whatever. Um, throw some syntax into into the uh, chat. Yeah, I'll put it in the doc. Uh, I'll do it in the first block. Uh, oh, it means my space not working. Oh, Where is my at the doc. Okay, the second mail went from this guy. Boom, boom, boom. Ah, there we go. Um, so let me see a uh, simple example. Uh, hey, Zen. Uh, full bar. Um, uh, else for two. Okay, pattern matching. That's a big font. Yeah, Let actually. some, yeah. <laughs> I'll reduce that. That's uh, maybe a little oh, I'll, I'll do it for you while you're. Uh, I hurt you, but we'll see. There we go. Whoa, I won't do it. Uh, but so point is, when, when you basically use a let to define variables, you, you can specify a pattern. Uh, if it's a refutable pattern, uh, you have to specify a else block, which has then has to return break whatever from the surrounding scope. Uh, if the pattern is irrefutable, uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, and this is fairly straightforward to implement. I have it working, um, currently not the most efficient. It sort of translates to be essentially just a you know, bunch of- Hey, let me share tests. the, we'll go for I'm gonna share the doc here. Um, hey, Soren, the, you made it. I'll make you the, do an intro in a minute here. The challenge here becomes if you have- Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, oh. <clears throat> Let me add the code. That's maybe a bit easier to explain. Um, so do something like case. Let's sum foo bar. Right. So <clears throat> if you have a single let, it's fairly straightforward. You'll always have one pattern, one value, um, easy to type check, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> when you have multiple patterns in your traditional match switch, you know, whatever your language calls it, uh, things get a bit more difficult, especially in the presence of nested patterns. So if, if you couldn't specify nested patterns, it would be trivial, basically. Uh, now I've been reading up on how to deal with exhaust exhaustiveness checking and how to compile pattern matching. There are a bunch of papers, they rely on decision trees, um, the recurring issue I keep bumping into is that they're all written in either Haskell, ML, OCaml, languages that are that I'm not familiar with. 
but they're also super dense. And yeah. the papers, unfortunately, are how, how do I put this delicately? Um, not approachable yeah. at all unless you are basically a PhD yeah. and you've been doing this for like 10 years. Yeah, right. Um, obtuse is what I was going for, but yes. So there's one paper, it's called something like compiling pattern matching to good decision trees or something. And some newer paper from Simon Payton Jones. I I basically look at those and I'm just like, yeah, no, I'm too stupid for this. I, I don't understand a single thing. Um, no. I did yeah. end up finding a repository where somebody implemented sort of basic I think pattern matching rules for the upcoming pattern matching implementation of C++ 11, whatever version. No. Um, but that too is a little difficult to follow because I see the code. C++ 11? No, C++ 2200. I don't know, whatever the upcoming okay, version fine. is. Um, they, they call it inspect because I know match was too straightforward, I guess. Fine. Um, but the, the issue there is they have code. There's a paper. The paper just sort of describes the rules, but not the algorithm. The code implements some algorithm, but it's a bit hard to figure out, okay, what exactly are they doing? Why? And based on the number of to-dos, I'm like, hmm, not sure if I should be using this as a reference. Uh, and so long story short, at... my, my problem is basically I'm trying to see if there's a, um, a sort of description or algorithm of pedometry, preferably with some sort of imperative language used to implement it. I was going to say, so look can... at, is Java's pattern matching strong enough? I don't think so. I don't think they, from what I recall, there are plans to add more sophisticated pattern matching, but I yeah. don't think it's there so yet. Basically, pattern matching is a, a sum of three things the switch statement, the disruptive pattern, as you mentioned it here, that is. Um, uh, bounding the variables and uh, inspecting are they are part of some hierarchy so enable to exhaustively check the, did you cover something and uh, and pattern matching with the uh, guard introducing an if statement like yeah, so the if statement part seems easy that's just like you add it in yeah, yeah so, so, so if statements uh, as far as i understand the easiest approach when you do exhaustive exhaustiveness checking you just say mm -hmm. is it if it has a guard we don't consider it like yeah, you have but, to add uh, a version without a guard. The, the problem, not the problem, the tricky part is how um, it's basically another if statement that will allow you to bound anything that uh, reference the outer scope, if you will. Uh, so I, I believe it, it wouldn't so, be that hard. So yeah. your, your example right now has a complete test for some and a guarded following. I would claim the compiler should give you an error uh, because you had a guard following a complete version, yes. Yeah, it like should this. be the other way around. <laughs> right, right. Now, in this version here, I, I would claim that you could write it more efficiently by saying if else, if somehow, I don't know how to do right. that. But so, what you've done should... Yeah, so the the idea I had, because basically all these papers, as far as I could find them, they, they essentially create a matrix of the sort of patterns and then... They, they try to do two things. One, exhaustiveness checking and uh, detecting redundant patterns. Yeah. And two, they try to make it such that um, patterns are tested uh, not more than once. Yeah. In other words, they try to go for the most efficient. Yeah, make, make, a, make an uglier example. Because I, I, the ones uh, that come out of the Java land, they use the class hierarchy to demand a tree, essentially. And then they verify that the children come before the parents in the tree. And that's all they need to do. Maybe but if you had some, some, uh, yeah, right. Right. And then, and then here you've got a set of three booleans. It's a good one. So it's a set of three booleans for which you can obviously do an eight way breakdown, but now you're obviously getting complicated. Right. So for the runtime part, I, for the time being, I don't care if patterns are tested multiple times. In fact, I'm actually fine if it just goes top to bottom, you know, test the same thing 15 times. I, I don't care for now. Yeah, right. Well, the optimizer under the hood turns into a single compute and then a Boolean flag, he'll check again. Right. So, could... so in terms of performance, all I care about is that if you match against yeah. um, algebraic data types, it preferably does a jumps table. But even there, for now, I'm fine with just a nested if because I, I don't have a released version yet. So I, I just want to yeah. make it work, not work fast. 
Yeah. I mean, as um, soon as you come up with uh, uh, you're right. Yeah. I'm so I think the, Java, I did the the version of the table, but I was handed the table in the first place, and then I decided to either table it or I'd turn it into a nested if with bottomed out at tables. Right. But I got handed the table. So yeah. there's a couple of ideas I had. The first one is you could sort of desugar your pattern match with nested patterns into one where you have nested match expressions, and so each um, uh, arm essentially only has one pattern. Yeah. And then exhaustiveness checking becomes quite easy because at every given match, you know the value and you don't have to recurse into things to determine exhaustiveness. The downside is that you get dog shit error messages. Like you'll get oh. some error message say like, oh, the, you know, if you have, um, Let's say uh, one of this this tuple example. It will say like, "Oh, the pattern two is not covered, like somewhere in the middle." And like what? <laughs> like preferably, it would say, "Oh, the pattern true true false or true false two is not covered." Yeah, okay, so that you're... that one you should be able to get, but you have to carry the error information through. Right, and then the the other idea I had because this desugaring is it is doable. Um, the other idea I had was that you. Take the value that you are matching against, so this tuple, true, false, true, and you basically build a tree of all these sort of sub patterns that are possible. So your input and your true, false, true, it's, it's sub nodes will be true, 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 false, false, or false, you know, et cetera. And then the leaf nodes you end up marking as uh, visited, whatever, and they signal, hey, this pattern leading up to that node is covered. And then you would have that node and using some sort of recursive descent mechanism, you would recurse into a pattern, recurse into its corresponding nodes and you know, mark them as you go. And then at the end, you're left with a tree where some of the leaf nodes are visited and some are not. In those cases, you produce an error. And I guess if you want redundant patterns, you use a counter, I guess, to mark how many times you visit something. Um, so I think in theory that could work but based on the approach taken by all these papers, I'm kind of like, this This feels quite wasteful, I guess, because you're building up this potentially about a big tree, visiting it at least twice, once to you know mark things as visited, covered it, whatever, and once to check it again. Um, and <clears throat> from what I've seen, these papers, they generally use um, not trees, but stacks. Where they have like you know a stack of patterns and rules and push and pop blah blah blah. <clears throat> so I'm kind of wondering like how how the hell are you going to approach this um, if you're not going to rely or you can't understand these very computer science heavy techniques uh, that are very popular like Haskell or Camel you know whatever the functional language may be. So there are three different problems you're dealing with you've got um what uh, what they call deconstruction patterns uh that that tackle part of it um and uh then you've got the um, compiler provable um uh, coverage of the the possible uh, combinations of values for for totality and then you've got how do you produce code that 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 implements what you're looking to achieve and those are like three discrete problems so for example in the compiler side you know uh, in a lot of these you have known arity domains which is why you can prove the uh, totality and the, the the easiest trick that we figured out for for that one was the the same way you do multi-dimensional arrays and in, in assembly which is you know in the case of match true false true for example that's two times two times two so it's a, an array of eight and, and you color it as a as a bit mask and then your totality is is pretty freaking simple um and if you don't have known area domains then you can't prove totality i mean it, it that's the. Uh, if you can prove totality, I believe it should demand the underscore the catch-all pattern. That's way. Yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. If you can't show it, you demand a. 
So, right. so, right. so for the booleans, this is uh, it's a it's the simple case because the, there are only two possible values. But let's say for an integer, uh, it uh, at some point it has to if you didn't cover uh, if you didn't prove totality, it should demand or underscore or at least tell you. Uh, it's up to the implementer to choose how ever to inform the user. For X to yeah. C, do you require that they be non-overlapping or just that you covered everything by the end of the match? The non-overlapping case, I believe it would be harder. That's why, let's say for Scala, if you overlap a pattern, it doesn't tell you that it subsumes. It, or uh, in some case, it can tell you that this pattern, it may be, never be reached, but uh, that's about it's, it's the totality okay. it gets. It's a mistake, I think, to do the non-overlapping, uh, which mm -hmm which uh, Java does, but it, Java only has a, uh, a single value switch statement. Um, so then it doesn't yeah. matter. But in the multi-value switch statements, it's actually quite uh, handy to have overlapping, especially when you combine it with things like ranges. So you may be matching a number and something else. And so you say, okay, if it's four, I want to do something. But if it's two dot dot seven, I want to do something else. Oh. What do I do? Say two dot dot three comma five dot dot seven? Like fuck that! Like it's idiotic. Um, so having having the order uh, of the cases be relevant is 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 quite natural, and allowing overlap uh, is also quite natural. There's one other reason that overlap um, or uh, or repetitive values comes into play quite a bit, and that has to do with um, uh, link time constants. So when you're doing cross-module constant resolution, uh, where the where the constant, let's say you have a constant that's called version, you know, chances are that's going to change, right? So it's version one, then it's version two, and it's version three, and you have a, a switch, you know, and it says, you know, and you want to use version in the case, not in the match, but in the case, right? Because uh, so it's something that is known at link time, but isn't is not a compile time constant, right? And in that case, and in that case, it becomes quite quite understandable why you could have uh, overlap. You're you're um, sort of blending a thing that Java blended much more finely, which was there are stages of when you know things and when you right. generate code, right. and you picked up a constant later in life. But in a in a jitted system, things could be declared constant that were discovered completely at runtime only. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So at compile time, you want to point out obvious errors, but at link time, you, you want to make a little bit more allowance. Link to jit time, if you will. You want to make a little more allowance for the fact that things might have been not provably wrong at compile time, and that the intent you know that the intent was 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 clearly described by the developer so you know something something that in java would be a a compile time error you want to allow through so so your your claim or your your example is that i have a match off uh uh, uh off some some version right and i want to have a, a case where the value in the case is the actual right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and now what Java, do, what Java does is it compiles Java compiles okay. the compile time value of this version. So if it doesn't have a compile time value, it's a compiler error. Yeah. Um, uh, and and what that means is if the version so it, it takes this version from the other module. So if you change the other module, it doesn't change the switch statement, and that's that's a uh, well. It's a purposeful choice in Java. I just, I just don't happen to right. Work. And if you wanted to be more flexible here, this would turn into load a variable ver called this version and compare it against whatever you're passing in. Um, as hey, opposed to a constant. Um, well, uh, I consider it a constant, but it's not a compile time constant. It's a link time constant. Right. Right. Well. Well. So w whenever you decide you're doing cogen, some point later in life. Right. It becomes yep. a constant. This could be baked into a lookup table. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Uh, Yorick, does your type system is infer or it's totally specified by the user? Um, 
uh, arguments, uh, return types and such are inferred, but uh, you know, local variables, uh, generics and that sort of thing are inferred. I, I don't have global type inference. Yeah. Uh, I, the... I basically take the same approach as Rust in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Because the pattern matching uh, has uh, a lot of thing, uh, a lot of times uh, deals uh, more deeply into types. Uh, so yeah. So, so in my case, the um, pattern matching when um, like all types at that point are known, uh -huh. so it doesn't have to def infer the actual pattern based on some sub pattern or you know whatever voodoo. So because you at least you have uh, you have to know the type you are matching with. Yeah. That's so so start. that is known. Yeah, uh, okay. it, it knows the the input type mm -hmm. uh, from the patterns. It will know, you know, what the classes and whatnot are, etc. Cameron, so, put that in the links section. Shall do. Shall do. I, so I, I think my my question, I guess, can be broken up into uh, two components. Because overlapping patterns, I agree. I uh, don't give a shit. Like I, mm -hmm. I actually like it if you have you know one to ten, one to ten if blah. Yeah. Um, basically, one. It will be exhaustiveness checking, yeah. and I guess the code gen is uh, th that one is reasonably easy, in the sense that if I guess if you match against an enum, you just use a jump table for everything else, a nested if uh, that I'll be able to figure out because okay. decision trees so, and all that stuff I, so I want to avoid it for now. My hunch is that you have to track at least two two things. Uh, at first, does you match on a value? So if you match on an integer, you're much more you're concerned with the actual value. If you match on a class on a, something that has an inheritance hierarchy, that when this other kind of exhaustive, exhaustiveness come into play, we, you have to track what with what type you're working with. That's right. It's not a sequential. It's not a sequential value range. It's actually a hierarchical value range. Yeah. yeah. The, the, that's much, that's much yeah, harder, and then the graph value range is even harder. So you have to track the exhaustiveness. We'll switch from the value to uh, to the type hierarchy. Did you cover all the cases? Um, so I, at, at least to me, you have to track these uh, at the at the beginning of the pattern match. You have to track yeah. with what we're working with. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so the third idea I had of mine is you know did this tree idea I had. I, I guess it works and I guess it's not the worst, but I I think generally my approach, if I have to build a tree and visit it more than once, I feel like there must be a better way. So, okay. Think, so a couple things so, here. Um, sorry, one second. Two. So the third idea I had was basically, I guess you have two stacks, one of the patterns you're testing for or the, the cases basically. Mm -hmm. And one of the patterns you're testing against, and you mm. start with the cases stack as all those cases that you know the the programmer lists explicitly, mm -hmm. and then the patterns start just with the root pattern, the one in the match uh, after the match keyword, mm -hmm. and that one you sort of expand. So mm -hmm. if if you have like um, if you're initially matching against you know two tuple of true and true, <clears throat> start with one value you find oh it has multiple Subtail is like true, false, false, true, false, false, etc. So the compiler at this point would know that we can prove exhaustiveness, but that's, that's the easy case. But the well, so the not. idea is basically rather than building this tree up front, you essentially use a stack or two and you push, uh, sorry, you um, produce and remove values as you quote unquote descend into patterns. Mm -hmm. oh. And exhaustiveness would mean that I guess the uh, I guess the rules stack is empty because you've tested all. Uh, so you know, the inputs stack basically is empty, meaning you've tested against all of them. But then redundant patterns, I guess, would appear twice. It, that's kind of where, like, uh, you know, how, how do we also uh, even begin to visualize this? So, <laughs> right. So in the so walking a tree is generally fairly inexpensive, just makes life more complicated to think about the invariants. I wouldn't be too, I wouldn't shy away from walking a tree twice. There may be a faster algorithm, but if you understand what you're doing, it's probably okay. Um, and then I was thinking for the case of a single pattern, it's too easy to think about, or we've talked about already, there's an obvious way to go. As soon as you have multiple things, you do get the, the in way, question of correctness. I think the code generation here is sort of fairly straightforward in all directions. Um, you're just gonna walk in some order and implement 
an if then else tree for your starter and then you can get clever after that. Jump tables are only useful if you have a high flow rate and a dense set of choices you're picking between. Um, otherwise, you you know, performance wise, you're just going to use a, a, a histogram sorted, you know, Huffman encoded if tree. And if you don't have any any reason to have any scheduling or any, any performance counters, just a fucking if tree and you're, you're done. Walk away from it. Um, the real thing for me is that you want to cover your semantics well in a way that's easy to handle. And for this one, um, I claim that you want to do something in the IR that directly says I'm doing an in-way match. Then you can encode the shit out of it under the hood as special cases left and right or however you want to implement it. But at the top, higher level of the IR, there's a semantic construct. Go to some high level matching equivalent thing in the IR that says, here's my external pattern. Here's where I plug in the holes where I have things I have to match against. Here's the type of each of the thing I'm going to match against so I can figure out if I'm looking at a class with a tree match or I'm looking at a number range match or whatever the hell I'm going to do. If true, false, I have an enum that I have an exclusive range I can do completeness checking on. And then you, you have it all in front of you in one place and you can write some algorithm at that point that says, okay, I'm either going to go left or right on the patterns and blow up if you're out of order, or I'm going to sort them internally and decide that I, I don't care. Like you said, oh, I like overlapping patterns, but if I have a guard that follows a full test, should I throw an error out at you or should I just sort the guard first? So that's, that's the, uh, I, I, that's the approach I love, which is, you know, do the heavy lifting, whatever heavy lifting you can do in the compiler phase, do it. Right. Yeah. And then defer the choices of how to implement it to the link phase or the JIT phase. Yeah. yeah. Cogen some, sometime later. Yes. You're going to so start the, life. Yeah. 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 So the, so the IR looks more like the source code than it does like assembly code. At this point, yeah, I would say so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you design the IR to carry the semantic of the of the source language, and then your then your code gen or interpreter or whatever gets to make a decision based on the information it has and the data structures it has. Right. So you do the heavy lifting of proof at compile time, and then let the let the uh, code gen do the do the optimization. So comes hand in hand with that comes this notion of lowering. Um, and I certainly do a lowering game in, in the hotspot. Like I have a jump table IR in C2. Then at some point I have profile data and I have density on the table and I do a heuristic. It's really early on, but it's definitely, there's a first step. There is a switch. I just ate the byte codes directly. And then I said, Hey, I have some profile data on these bytecodes. I have some knowledge of the incoming thing. I'm going to take that switch and break it up into a dense table that I say I've densified it already. Don't touch it. Or in, in, a, in a series of Huffman encoded trees. Now I have a bunch of ifs and my, my lower level IR understands ifs directly and somebody understands a dense table directly. But the, the original table I'm handed can be very sparse or very lopsided in, in frequencies of execution. And I don't care, but I can now do a completeness check. I can now do range bounds. Like I have to know if a table switch from Java bytecodes, I have to do range checking on the table and all that kind of shit. That's all thrown into the IR. And now the IR just sees if statements that he knows how to handle with, except for the one magic. It's a dense type table. Emit the obvious x86 dense type table code. And he doesn't do anything else with it, you know, in terms of, you know, semantically, it, it's a multi-way switch, like an if that goes in ways, whatever. So there's there's a thing there that says I lowered. I lowered pretty early, but I, I totally started with, I have a Java table switch. So I would start with, I have a Inco match statement and it has the following components. And then as you go along, decide, this I'm gonna do is a series of nested ifs. So I'm just gonna turn it into a tree and the leaves all bottom out at something stupid. And then, and then the middle and the lower end of the IR don't have to deal with a special, I'm an inco match statement, but you wanna start with the match to do the semantic analysis as a minimum and, and then some way to lower it from there. Right, so, so in my IR currently, um, <clears throat> the, um, the initial example showed with the let, that basically compiles to yeah, a bunch of equality checks and jumps. Uh, there's, there's nothing really special in the IR uh, in regards to pattern matching. For the 
uh, case where you are matching against uh, algebraic data types, I do have a switch instruction, which um, takes a array of integers as whatever the values are that you're matching against, and then an array of basic blocks to jump to for that yeah. value. Yeah, that's my low level switch right. equivalent, yeah. And you know whether that actually is a jump table or a nested if, you know, that's for later. Uh, I, so, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. so I think that the code generation part is fa fairly straightforward. I mean, worst case, you do nested ifs for everything, and you say, you know, it's version zero point whatever. Who cares? You don't care. Yeah, that's right. Yep. It's that. Yeah, it's that exhaustive bleh, exhaustiveness checking where, in particular. I want it when you produce an error, it should say, hey, this full pattern is not covered rather than yep. this, hey, we find this tiny chunk that might be part of a right. bigger pattern, right. but we're not going to tell you. That's why you have a high level version first because you can error check it and then you get an error message out of it. That's saying, yeah, I've spent a lot of effort on error messages in AA. I haven't written any code in it, so I don't know how they work, but but I can right. I can produce, I have all the information necessary to produce a sane error message. Uh, or at least I claim I do. do a so, lot of so maybe uh, Teodoro knows this because he mentioned Scala. Um, do you happen to know what a pro, uh, sort of what algorithm Scala use? I'm, I'm guessing one of the functional programming mm, ones. But... The one of the instrumental uh, stuff Scala does here is the algorithm as seen from. Uh, it's pretty instrumental for the pattern matching because it tries to uh, to guess that to tell you about the type based it on the uh, some known path. Uh, if you are familiar with this algorithm, it's pretty instrumental to the pattern match too. And I believe in some of the talks there mentioned there was a bug in the pattern matching. If you destruct a list to a head and a tail, and you ask it, well, what's the type of the x dot head? It will take it will tell you T because that was a bug in the compiler. It doesn't it doesn't follow the as seen from to know that this T is in, for example, for for the for uh, for the purpose of the list. If the if you were pattern matching on a list and you destruct the list, it should know that the contents of the list are of type int. But there was a bug in the earlier scale. Uh, right. So, so they sort of do type inference as part of yeah. pattern matching, if I understand yeah. it correctly. So, I'm, I'm uh, so, ready. I'm going to do that in AA and just ultimately type reference is just going to run on the IR. So it, it, because uh, all of, they have to figure out the type, I don't know the exhaustiveness uh, checking uh, yeah. how 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 they done exactly. I may be dug in, but, but I know that the, it's instrumental to the as from algorithm right. because it's pretty core to how the Scala does stuff. Right. Particularly if you're using options all over the place, you know? match is this a none type or is this a some type of whatever type okay unwrap the thing you really want that to boil down into a null check that's cheap so right. most of the purpose in most of the time the match statement has to boil to a nif state to a check it has to most of the time if you're if you're matching on a type this will boil down to an instance of check or if you mm -hmm. match on the value, that will that will boil down to this kind of check. The the core idea is that the pattern matching should disappear as a construct to the code generation. That, that right. uh, should boil down to just a check. Yeah, but so I, I guess I can with that sort of narrow down my question. Like, how I sort of know the answer already, but how crazy is it if you basically take the value you are matching against? So this is a triple of three booleans, and you essentially generate a tree of sort of all possible combinations, and then yeah, you that, visit those, mark it as visited, and that's sort of how you determine exhaustiveness. Yeah, that that's the the to, the totality path that the uh, Agda takes. I will show you a link. There is a paper that calls a Foetus that does exactly this a matrix uh, kind of things. Uh, I will find it uh, through the talk and throw a link. That is exactly yeah. how I, 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 the proof for totality or absence of totality. That's how we do it. With bit, we use bit sets to do bit it. Sets. Yeah. Okay, okay, so, so which case. works well if you have three booleans and less yeah. well if you have 64. This, kind, this kinds, yeah, this no, kinds no, go bit, to- Bit sets work way on 64. You just gotta better have some some underbars in your uh, pattern matcher. You're gonna gonna so in cases of bit set, then how, 
because a bit set being a linear data structure, right? You can't really sort of quote unquote uh, recurse into it like a tree. How... No, 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 no. You, you have you have, you have a, a tree of classes if you're doing my my. I'm a number. I'm a double. I'm a complex. I'm a real, which is subclassed by an integer, whatever the hell. You have a tree. That you're gonna walk. Now, are you exhausted? So in, in the case of maybe in a tree, you can say, I didn't cover all the leaves somehow, but if you have a set of known classes at JIT time or runtime, you could just put a bit set down and tickle a bit every time you walk over somebody and then they're all covered or they're not. Right, if you have, if you have closure over the type system, at least a, a snapshot closure, meaning you, you know which classes and types you're dealing with at compile time, you can assign each one an index, you know, zero to N, and then for each type, you keep a, a bit set of its of its coverage. Yeah. So for a tree, think of it that the root has all the bits set. The left branch of the root has only half the bits set. The right branch of the root has only half the. I'm talking binary tree in this case, but but you, if you if you think of it as a tree, each node in the tree can carry the bit set of all the nodes under. Yeah. So, so you right, can still use then... a bit set. I mean, but but basically, what you want to do is have two algorithms. One that says is the arity such that I can, so, so if I have a switch of five values and one is a uh, int 64 and another is a, uh, another int 64 and another is a, like at some point you look at it and say, you know, I'm not gonna use a bit set for this. It's too many. I'll, 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 I'll fall to something that's less efficient. Um, you know, I'll, I'll deal with it, right? Right, so, so in that case, let's say you have a pattern where it's like, oh, I expect a sum that contains a tuple of value true and uh, a placeholder or false. You basically have a nested pattern. Yeah. Right. So how, point... how would you know that, for example, for that tuple, or I guess the first value in the tuple, it has to use index five in the bit set, whatever. How... Oh, um so, so my way of thinking is a bit set essentially being linear. Yes, you need okay. to map this sort of nested pattern, each node in that needs to be mapped to an index in that bit set. Yeah, right. you walk so the pattern you... one time while you're parsing. Right. While you walk it and you know you're in a pattern, you, you start a, a counter, a dense integer counter that is unique to this one pattern. And you give everybody a number as you walk. Right. Now you have a pile of numbers from one to the 10 <clears throat> elements of your pattern. And now you can go through and, and have a dense pattern number. You, you, oh, you right. Be... Yeah, and I guess then you have like a separate data structure that says, oh, if we need to produce an error, the this index and this bit set translate to this sort of Yeah, right. Uh, so, so, the guys in, right so the guys involved in the pattern, the, the pattern match guy himself, I usually carry these bi-directional maps just so I can go from bit set to node of pattern and back and forth only during parse and semantic analysis when I'm going to throw errors at you. Right. Once I'm past that point, I have some IR that densely encodes the semantics but doesn't do any error checking, doesn't know how to do any error checking. It's already been done. Right. So in that case, though, let's say... Um... Because in that case, you basically assign indexes based on the patterns specified. So if I specify, let's say, uh, let's say four patterns, but I have there are six in total. You visit those five. You basically mark all their entries in the bit set. How would you detect then? Like, hey, we're missing two patterns. To if you walk the bit set, it should be completely set. The, right, the but, zeros mm -hmm. that were so. Um, Uh, let me see how I explain this. Uh, let's say I have a match and I match against a tuple of two booleans. Yeah. I say my first case, I expect true and true. And in my second case, I say I expect false and false. Yeah. I, I guess that would be uh, one, two, so, so when you, four entries in the bit set. Yeah. So as soon as you see a, a boolean, you need two bits to cover the four cases that you can have. Uh. Right, so, so I guess then what happens is you, the, the size of the bit set is dictated by the value you're matching against, not the yes. number of rules. Yes, so, right. so, okay. Right. Okay. so you could argue that it's a less efficient, it's a stupid easy thing that's less efficient if the patterns have large numbers of holes in them. 
So if you do a tree pattern because you're doing an instance of check, um, you know, you could argue that I, I want to do a tree like thing. But if you're doing uh, uh, integer ranges that are dense, uh, but but fixed in size of days of the week of seven, I'm just going to throw my seven bits in and walk away from them, right? And then somewhere in the world, I have, like I said, I have a map that goes left and right that I just do at the time I'm building the match, but before I visit any of the cases. So I've said the match keyword, I'm walking this expression. I'm picking up parts and I don't know what my, my cases look like yet, but I know all my parts have the following arities and they're tree-like or they are uh, integer ranges from zero to one for Booleans or zero to seven or whatever, I have this. And then I make a map for my bits. And now I go walk my cases and I fill in the bits as I walk in the cases. And then when I get done, you know, if I got any zeros left over, I miss some bits. And then I have my reverse map and I go back backwards through the case and says, well, you, you asked for the days of the week, but you didn't do Wednesday because that bit's not set. So somehow a Wednesday on this guy, and I have to have multiples of these if you have repeated versions for tuples of Wednesday versus cats and Wednesday versus dogs or whatever. So the bit set will blow up some, but if it blows up really big, then yeah, as Cameron's saying, maybe maybe bit set's not a good one. It's, it's a cheap and easy one. That's the main deal with it. And it will cover all your cases. You always need a follow up, a backup plan. And it kind of usually makes sense to have the backup plan that covers everybody be as general purpose as possible. And then there's a common set of patterns you might cheat on the backup plan, but the backup plan has to kind of be done first. It covers all your cases. Uh, which bit sets will typically do. Like if I'm doing integer ranges from billions to billions, I, that's not going to be a complete range and I don't care. How about with it, uh, if you bound a variable with a test in it, if it's uh, less than... Well, I would um, claim that the tests should go in order. Like I don't do Turing completeness on if tests. I have no clue. So there's the no test version comes last or you weren't complete but, and then the tested versions all come in the order that you wrote them in and i and from the semantic analysis point of view i have no clue what they mean so any one test is as good as any other i'll just run them in order without any brains to them at all no language runtime semantic brains to the tests at all mm. and then if you have a uh, if you fail to have a complete test afterwards then that particular set of things was not complete Mm -hmm. but, but but you if you bound the test in it you have to know that the tests cover well if you for example uh, match on an integer and you have a test that an integer has to be below 100,000 then the test checks or above 100,000 and then you know you have to check the exhaustedness for the 100,000 so, if it's so, above right, and so, the so, pattern still catches the value right so, so here you're getting into I can extend my knowledge of patterns by saying I have a, a pattern test that does something specifically only with integer ranges, not with float ranges, not with pairs of ints or ints uh, less than or greater than just one integer versus a constant range. I can declare, I understand this pattern semantically enough that I can invert it and claim you have to cover the other half or you're not complete. Hmm. So if in Cameron's earlier case, he said, I have a four, test for four, then I have a test for zero to seven for the days of the week, then I have a test for zero to 31 on the same value for a month or whatever the hell it is, at some point, the semantic analysis you're running here gets confused and doesn't know how to say you're complete or you're not complete because he's not sure what you're covered, mm -hmm. right? You, 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 if you did a bit set and said I'm covering bits in a bit set, maybe, but as soon as I have wonky weird shit where I do the range from 2 billion to 3 billion or the range from minus 1 billion to minus 1 billion and 1 and whatever else, I can't represent that reasonably. How do I know I'm complete? When do I give it up and say, I'm not even going to try to be complete. I'm just going to say, eh, have a no, no test version. That's complete. But if you have a test, I have no freaking clue what, what part of the available space you've actually covered. Yeah. So Yorick, uh, does the, uh, you envision the pattern matching to do a totality check for the values and exhaustiveness checks for the hierarchy? So does this sound... Um... A little confused as the difference between totality and exhaustiveness. Yeah. But the same thing for turn, but yeah. um, I, I said it in this way because the totality will be that the pattern matching always terminates. That's the totality. The exhaustiveness is that does you uh, cover all the cases in 
uh, for example, uh, for the case for the values, this, this means the same thing. But um, for the values, it's harder as we as we were discussing because you, if you have a patterns, if you have ranges, that the proving of the totality of the problem becomes. All right. So um, the the approach I wanted to take is fairly straightforward. Um, if you have values that are theoretically infinite, I mean they might not be, but like integers, strings. Uh, for example, there you just have to specify a fallback case, even if you know if you were to match against an integer, and you were still to specify two to the power of sixty-four patterns, it would still say no. You need a fallback. Yeah. Um, for enums, uh, it would you know just check basically the, the the tag values that are possible. For the enums, you would know you have a known set of yeah, cases. Yeah, it, it's finite. Mm. Um, and for Booleans, it's also finite, like, you know, a Boolean only has two values. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, for instance strings, you would just say no, no, provide a fallback always. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the example I gave that you test, you have a check for a value that cover all the cases, let's say above 100,000, the program shouldn't, should or should not tell you about that you haven't covered all the cases. Or if you know that a possible values, let's say for an integer, must have a bottom check, must have a. Underscore. Yeah. So, so as an example, if I match against you know the number forty-two, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not necessarily literal, but it happens to be forty-two. Okay. And then my pattern, I say a range from, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is it, minus two to the power of forty, whatever the, the mm -hmm. smallest mm -hmm. value of sixty-four bit int is, signed one, you know, from that range to the maximum. It, the compiler still says, no, you have to add a fallback case, yeah. even mm -hmm. though theoretically okay. that range would cover it. Yeah. Simply because in the case of integers, mm -hmm. first of all, there's so many possible values. Like even with a byte, you have 255 values. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to write 255 patterns. Oh. Usually it's yeah. more like oh, yeah. I'm matching against the well, byte. I. <laughs> but okay, the, you know, if you're cliff click, you know, you might be one well, in Cameron a million. Cameron said he did too. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's ever written an assembler has definitely had a, a switch yeah. of, of yeah. 250. Right, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but or, or most Alexa, people, Alexa when you're matching against cool. ints, yeah, you're either parser. looking for like a specific subset, like you, you're writing a parser, you, you care only about a subset of bytes. Yeah. And you might say, hey, I care about the byte range A to Z. Mm -hmm. I forgot what the actual bytes were, but mm -hmm. but you're not gonna. Most people wouldn't write like, "Hey, I mesh against an integer. Here's ten thousand patterns." Uh, no, you just say, you know, provide a fallback. Right, should be right. sufficient. Mm -hmm. like okay, uh, I think of uh, another case that has Scala supports for the pattern matching that you cast, uh, you test the X if it's some other type because you matching on a type the. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because um, so at least my language doesn't allow casting between mm -hmm. different classes. Uh, actually, uh, so in fact, you you uh, put it this way: if you have a class, you can cast it to an interface if it implements the interface. The other way around is not valid. Mm -hmm. Nor can you cast a string to to a cat, for example. Mm -hmm. so you can only go down. If it's correctly. Uh, up the hierarchy, I guess. Yeah, basically, you give up uh, mm -hmm. permissions, if you will. So, the how would you destruct an interface match? Uh, at the you can't. At the... You can't match mm. against an interface. Uh, mm. it, it's straight because up just. Scala. Scala... No, so, so if you have like a value that's like you know the the uh, uh, to list interface, and you do a pattern match, the compiler will be like no, no, mm -hmm. that's that's not a class. Go away. <laughs> right. Oh. Right. It's a class. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. At least it should. I, I don't know if I actually have an explicit check for that, but that will be the case, basically. Like I could write an if test that you're an interface, but I wouldn't do a pattern match that you're an interface. So, so, so I don't I don't support runtime type checking. <laughs> There's no so, instance off in my language because I, oh. I, I, I don't the, like it. The gist of it, of, I, I think of a pattern matching, what is, it's introducing on a variable and it puts it some context for Scala, for example, would be as seen from this variable, as seen from some pattern or prefix. Yeah, it's desugaring. I mean, uh, yeah, desugaring some complicated stride. Yeah, it so it, it does it does a, a series of guard tests or series semantically it does a series of if tests, if you will, 
and it de-sugars mm -hmm. components for you. This is, this is the combination of things. Yeah. This, you're like in town. Yeah, yeah. And then you'd but, love to get the totality check when you have a complete. Yeah, that, that's why I, I've tried to say that there is a little difference between exhaustiveness and totality because. All right. We beat this horse to death yet? <laughs> so yeah, that, no, that, I, I think I know enough to. Uh, useful. Do we continue. provide any useful feedback for you, Yorick? Well, that depends. Have we covered it totally or are you just exhausted for the conversation? <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> I'm feeling exhausted. Thank you. I wanted, I wanted to poke good Soren. Dad joke there. Good dad joke, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> if Soren would give us a 30 second of what he's doing. I saw closure yeah, I, in the name go by at some point. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I've been working in, in closure for a while and been very fascinated by it and um, and been a bit frustrated with what's called closure script, which is like a compiler for, 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 for JavaScript. Um, and then been a bit fascinated by WebAssembly that also is in S expressions and thought this might be interesting. So the ambitious end goal of what I'm trying to do is to yeah make a dynamic language runtime uh, in on WebAssembly and then do something a, a mini closure on top of it. But I'm not very far in the process. Your goal is to compile closure to WebAssembly. In the end, yeah. But um, as I said, it's a lot, a lot. Lots of bits are, are missing, and I'm not. Uh, I'm not so fond of just writing a bunch of C. So the low-level language that that generates the WebAssembly, I'm also making. <laughs> or so I'm making a, a macro, a, basically a macro assembler uh, for WebAssembly at the moment. But uh, yeah. Okay, now you have it, to ask a question. Stuff. Uh huh. You have to ask a question. I have to ask a question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't prepared that. <laughs> but this is new for me to see how badly I can torture new people. Mm. And the question has to be something with my project I'm struggling oh. with, or no? No, but you, you can't ask questions about like. My new house that doesn't count something to do something to do with compiler with coffee clubs about here compiler coffee club something to do garbage collection yeah that would be a good subject actually because WebAssembly doesn't have one and so i would be building something like that by myself um so right now i'm just doing bump allocation um because it's the yes. easiest <laughs> yeah so I'm just what wondering what, what would would the obvious next step be? Well, what happens be? when your bumps run out? Actually, yeah, I mean the, the bump allocator, a bump allocator with a ling, linear single thread compactor is probably your, your most efficient yeah. for WebAssembly right. because WebAssembly is single threaded and basically yeah. it's a it's basically yeah. eight, basically an eight bit computer. I mean, yeah, yeah but it's actually it, it's gotten threads now. I think in in many implementations. So oh, really, that's, yeah, that's coming. Oh. So in the absence of threads, I'm totally with Cameron, go, go online, get a tutorial on garbage collectors and, and implement the simplest possible garbage collector. Mm -hmm. in the, in and the there will be like a mark and sweep uh, garbage yeah. collector. Yeah. yeah, mark and sweep and then mark sweep compact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the, in the presence of threads, you'll have to find a way to get the other threads to stop reasonably. And I assume WebAssembly's runtime will include some kind of support for that. Whether or not they expose it for general use, I don't know. Nah, me neither. So, but but uh, again, you know that that's a case of of I have to halt everybody. Can you, Cameron? Do you know if you can get at the stacks in WebAssembly? Are they they just part of the exposed state. You said it's an eight bit computer. That's my recollection as well. But that means you have access to the stacks just straight up. Yeah. So. It's it's been a while since I worked with it, but I mean, this, if if you've done if you've done a uh, sixty eight thousand assembly, there's there's nothing crazy in WebAssembly. Like, well, I haven't, I haven't done anything with threads in Web, WebAssembly though. I mean, it was all, but it was all just, I mean, well, straightforward. How did you find what was a pointer and what was not a pointer on the active execution stack? 
everything is either one layer of indirection or you have a exact stack reference or you're doing a conservative collector. And yeah, you know, so you I wasn't so I wasn't actually writing in WebAssembly. I was mainly researching it just to make sure that we could support it as a back end. So you know, I evaluated it and then dropped it. But since I didn't use it in anger, it's it's more like right. I just have a, a general recollection. But you don't currently do code generation for WebAssembly. No, no. My thought was we just use LLVM for that because it has a, it has a WebAssembly backend. I would go ask the WebAssembly community if there's a plan for garbage collection. They probably have a plan already. That's a, that's a proposal out, um, but that I don't think you necessarily want to use that. Uh, Whatever the the proposal it contains, I haven't looked at it, but um, it, I think it might be interesting to to make one myself, also just for so for the fun. Yeah, others. I know the Chrome team was going back and forth on whether garbage collection should be a fundamental concept in WebAssembly or whether it should be here's a processor, right, a garbage collector. Like, right there, there is a. You don't have pointers, so so that it's not like there's a primitive. You you have you have numbers and 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 load and, and load from numbers consider them as pointers, right? So there's there's two things about garbage collector that should be kept separate here as orthogonal. One is I, I can I can write one at all. I can find all the threads. I can find all the pointers, including I can crawl all the stacks. I can stop running threads. Um, sometimes I want to be able to emit a read barrier. Sometimes I want to be able to emit a write barrier. OK, those are for the efficiency versions comes later. But if you can't find the pointers, crawl the stacks or modify them, you're stuck using a conservative collector, which is okay in some domains and not others. For people with large pointers and big spaces, 64 bit ints, do conservative collectors reasonable. For people with small integer values and small pointers, you quickly have heavy collisions between the ints and the pointers and a conservative collector will be way too conservative for, for use. Hmm. So you have to answer that question. Once you have the ability to find the pointers and change them, including on the stacks and stop threads and all that kind of shit, now you have a choice of garbage collectors to go implement. And you start with the easiest one, you ramp it up, but you can't get there at all until you can find the pointers, <laughs> crawl the stacks, read and write the stacks, you know, mm. stop the threads, that kind of shit. That has to happen first. Mm. This is the magic trick that makes garbage collection magical and that you can't just like, appended on to a language later is the ability to crawl the stacks and typically to mutate the stacks. Hmm. And that's that's the trick you have to solve first before you get into what to do next. And if WebAssembly won't do it, you can do like the Hans Boim conservative collector for C programs, you know. If you're at 64 bit ints, eh, you know, might be might be tolerable. All pointers are big numbers that are far away. All ints are small numbers that are close to zero and the two don't cross very often and therefore you're not very conservative. If the answer is my heap space is small and my pointers are just integers and they're the same range as your typical integers for doing string math and, you know, lookup tables and whatever kind of array indices, you get way too many collisions. So look at the uh, second link I put in the doc for the... Uh... On the link number three, the second one there, the that'll that'll give you an overview of all the instructions. Ah, oh, the second so, one there. Right. Yeah. So so it's 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 uh, what I'd call loosely typed, meaning that that the um, the IR is aware of a difference between a float thirty two and an int thirty two, for example. But other other than that, it's just a fairly boring IR. I mean. I'm sorry, you, you, as a, oh, he does have a load instruction that takes an integer. Right, so it's basically wow. your only data type is an integer and an array. <laughs> okay, so, okay. So memory, is, and um, so in, uh, correct if my memory is wrong on this, but the, uh, when, when you get memory in WebAssembly, I think what you basically do is you just ask for an array, right? It just gives you an array of memory and then you access it yeah. by index. So basically the combination of the array and the index is your pointer. Uh, it's not, there is just only one memory and that's the one you implicitly are looking into. That, that That's the ability to, or future possibility that uh, multiple memories will be added. But for now there's one memory and it's just, yeah, as you say, an array 
uh, that you can access and then right. so your yeah. pointers are just offsets in that array yeah. yeah 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 and if you want the first one to be null then you have to handle that yourself and there's no specific handling of that so what you could do there if your um your your runtime doesn't sort of permit um pointer detection um you can also create your uh, your own stack so this is what i did in inco um you know, before the work of getting rid of the garbage collector, uh, where the, the stack was actually just, um, or presumably the registers were just an array and of, of pointers, and registers were indexes to that array, and the, the values defaulted to null, and then my language doesn't use null pointers. Um, the sort of undefined pointer is some other immediate uh, value. And... Uh, in that case, if, if you have a stack frame, and you want to see, okay, what are the pointers reachable from this frame? You just traverse that array and ignore everything that's null and everything else is a pointer. Mm. It comes obviously with the downside that you have not like actual registers. There's you know, a bit of overhead. Um, yeah. But in my case, this was necessary anyway, as I wanted to support... Um, preemptive um, multitasking, basically be able to suspend a task at any point and resume it. And uh, Rust, which uh, my language is written in, um, didn't, still doesn't have stable ways of basically being able to take a stack, store it somewhere, and then restore it as you can do in C. There are a bunch of assembly hacks, but you know, you're, you're basically uh, walking on Legos. Mm. Um, so, so that's also an option in, for WebAssembly where you basically have your own stack and it's an array so you control what the values are. Yeah, thanks. Is your goal in targeting WebAssembly that you want speed that you can't get from JavaScript or just because it's cool? Mm, no, I, I, so if... It's a fun project. It's a project I do for fun. So it's it's mostly just to 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 learn more about it and and see if 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 I can generate efficient code. It might be that it's a dead end and I drop it. But for now, I'm I'm having lots of fun with it. Especially and also this goal of in the end doing closure is a long term goal. The short term goal is just to be able to do something which isn't writing WebAssembly, which is horrible, of course. So it's a macro assembler and and I can't do much yet besides doing like static strings and things like that but um yeah i would be tempted at the beginning to be like closure's nice i'm gonna start by implementing scheme <laughs> scheme <laughs> takes less time yeah true that that's probably where i'll go oh, I'm reading the web assembly in the last 30 seconds so i may have missed there is there is a frame but i don't see any way to ask the right kind of questions about a frame no so so, so you the, 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 there's no way of, of uh, telling an I-32 from uh, I-32 that's a pointer. You have to represent that yourself somehow. Yeah, yeah that I knew. So okay. in the land of uh, exact garbage collections, the compiler tracks that information and knows yeah. every instruction, whether you're referring to one or the other. The mm -hmm. problem is that the dynamic runtime, you have these things splattered on the stack and you have to walk the stack and, and you know by the what kind of thing is on the stack, whether what the name yeah. of the stack frame is. This is a function call invocation for blah. It has the following things on the stack frame. Okay, if you, if you could get at the stack, you could then pull out at offset zero, I have a pointer and offset 17, I have a pointer and offsets one through 16 or ints. So you could pull them out and do the garbage collection. Um, I can't see a way to self-reflect into your stack. No, um, but I may, like I said, I may have missed it. Could be there at the moment. I don't see a way to do it. They, they, they admit there's a stack. You can make a call. You can make a return. There's no comment over shit like stack overflow, right? So there's no, no explicit, hey, you know, here is the stack or not the stack. And then I can say, give me the, the return program counter, which I map back to the function that I compiled, which I map back to the so-called OOP map, the object-oriented program, the, the garbage collector pointer map, right? So without the ability to do that, like you can, you can build yourself all the return mappings if you could actually 
crawl the stack and ask the question, give me the return pointer. Okay, this is a return into the middle of this following function. I do my little hash table lookup, and this is the function that has the stack frame is five slots long, and two of these slots have pointers, have integer values that are actually pointers into an array, right? Stack walking proposal. There you go. Somebody threw that on the Dan threw it on the chat. Do you put it in the link in the put the link in the chat in the little, little doc? Um, okay, I won't read it now. There's a proposal. If you don't get stack walking, you can't have a you can only have a conservative GC. And in your case, it's probably fairly conservative. Thank you. Yeah. Into this. The way to make it less conservative now that I've said this stupidly is to add a giant offset to all arrays that you don't touch, which is just throwaway memory. So it just consumes memory that no one cares. If your implementation of WebAssembly handles holes and arrays, it, it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> all arrays start at size 1 billion and then add from there. And that makes, I can tell it easily, nearly all ints that are pointers from nearly all ints that are not pointers. So I think it was iffy that if you've got holes in the memory in WebAssembly, that it's like allocating one meg chunks or whatever. So 40K, yeah. 40k pages but, that, um, but yeah I, I, you can I, I, sort of spray across memory but you don't want to put like one byte here and one byte there and one byte yeah there, yeah but, i'm gonna a hole in that i have allocated in theory but i will never read or write to this hole and therefore i don't want i want the virtual memory system to silently not actually allocate any page here right but that was my thought if you want to say all of the memory that i allocate starts with eight ones that should be fine yeah, Sorry, but I'm, source, I'm not sure if you, oh, yeah. you do that though in WebAssembly, but I might be wrong. I can look you, into it. You have to get your starting pretty high. You, you want to be above millions. Not, I, I heard eight ones. I don't know what you meant by that. Oh, I was just going to set the whole first byte of the pointer so that um, it didn't tend to collide with the small numbers that I encounter a lot in normal programs. Yeah, okay, so there's, there's a good answer. There's another way to go, and that's tag all your pointers different from tag all your ints. You manually generate code that tags, and when you know you had a pointer, you untag it and do the reference and then retag it. You still have to crawl your stack, but you can tell them apart. That's not a bad answer. And of course, it'll generate suck-ass code. God, my, my video is just really terrific here, horrific. I look like I'm badly abused or super sunburned or something ridiculous. Clearly, you need more ring lights. I need something. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'll have to go ask my camera what the hell it's doing for video adjustment. It's clearly confused. I'll do that later. I don't want to sit here and fiddle with video settings. All right. Something else. Somebody threw out trace compilers. I'll go look here. Trace compilers. Oh, and TLB hits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, so Josh Fisher, there's a name I hadn't heard in a while. All right, Matt. Josh Fisher was my boss at HP Labs. I was in HP Labs with Josh Fisher working on compilers using the C2, I mean, the, the pre C2 base version that I came out of grad school with. That was, um, yeah, that was my attempt to save HP's compiler by, by pulling up a whole different way to do code gen. And they were kind of sort of interested and kind of sort of not. So I went through and wrote a their IR to my IR translator and we're well along the path of going to a C2 style code generator when Sun called me up and said, come join us. HP's come out with some interesting JITs recently that are like, oh, we want ARM-based HP's to run arbitrary x86 Windows programs. So we're going to JIT the x86 to ARM on the fly. Some some transliteration. Yeah. I don't know what the easier hard parts of JITting x86 is, though. Oh. I think of it more as a JIT target than a JIT source. Yeah, the, the problem with x86 is that people write self-modifying code. 
and and so you have to be prepared in your transliteration to deal with self-modifying code. Otherwise, I think it's not, as a transliteration target, it's not horrifically bad. It's ugly to parse the one time. You have to write the evil x86 instruction parser. Everyone who writes a disassembler has to deal with that. Okay, once you get over that hump, it's a vaguely risk-like 16 register machine with a lot of interesting memory addresses. Uh, and then it's fine. And then there's a bunch of weird instructions you wait, just wait, pick up which one is? x86, you're saying? Yeah, if you're transliterating x86 to, for instance, ARM, because you want to run it, or on any number of x86 replacement wannabes that are based on some other silicon than an x86 directly, of which I participated in several of those, um, you have a, a translation problem that starts with 99% of the instructions you're ever going to execute have a obnoxious but not terrific pattern to them and you're done and you implement them and that covers a nice 16 register risk like instruction set with fancy addressing nodes. Then there's 101 weird ass, weird ass 1% instructions you fault off to and you write a piece of C code to go implement the horrific thing that they do, you know, all the weird translate and byte reverse and shit like that. And you make them go fast later, but you just but there's, some, there's another problem as well, which is, which is you have variable length instructions, you have multi-byte instructions, obviously, yes. and you have no alignment of instructions. Yes. So the you can have a four-byte instruction that can also be a, if you, if you jump one byte further, it can also be a three-byte instruction yes. that does something completely fucking different. Right. So in the same place in memory, like, holy. Right. So I was, what I was coming around to was, this covers the 99% case. And then people write self-modifying code and people do jump in the middle of instructions, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. And it survives, but it was okay. And you have to deal with those, um, which you can do by doing a, a full, full call graph, control flow graph buildup and realize that you have extra entry points in the middle of instructions. And then you just treat them as a new, you clone the instruction fragment and treat it as new and carry on from there. Um, but it, but because of all the weird shit with self-modifying code and because of what Cameron just said, you do have a more complicated job to up and run everybody. If you are just going to up and run some finite set of x86 apps, usually they're all well behaved and you're done. If you're an old, old, old school game, you're writing, you're transliterating, you'll have a security startup thing that does self-modifying codes. You'll have to yep. sort your way around. Old games and uh, also this little program called Windows. So it uses oh, both it tricks. Good. Actually, it uses both tricks. It uses a self-modifying code and it also does the uh, purposely jump into the middle of instruction that I've already executed. Oh, I didn't know that one. Um, okay. So that if anyone is, is doing a, 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 a tracing disassembler yeah um it, it's designed to, to kneecap them right right to screw you up yeah i mean yes. i know that application that hp was bragging that their x86 chip could run was office on windows yeah which yeah. i imagine does everything you could think of to do in a piece do of software. horrific stuff yeah the other one to go after is uh, hotspot because it 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 does a lot of complicated shit. It handles every exception that you can throw on the planet. It throws them on purpose. It expects precise answers for stack overflows and page fault boundaries, and it does self modifying code in droves. So that's that's in my head. That's a a like like we, for the longest time we tried to get all these like data race detectors and shit to work. And they claim they'll do every possible plan thing on the planet. They'll handle everybody, but they won't handle hotspot. And they didn't handle hotspot for 20 years. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Where I, where I ran into all these nightmare scenarios, uh, Aaron, was I was uh, uh, years ago as a side project, just for the fun of it, I was building a Java uh, interpreter, if you will, for x86. Um, so I could run because because I had access to a thousand core x86 machine. You you may remember this machine, Cliff, uh, since since you and Arthur worked on it. Uh, you had access so, to one? Uh, kind of, yeah. I, I had a buddy named uh, Gil 
Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, right. Right. I created a project back then called J86. Anyway, I remember um, this. It was a bit of a failure. So, oh. but I but I did get to learn lots of painful things about x86 programs. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I grew up on the on the uh, Motorola assembly. So it's like after after you've worked with Motorola, switching to Intel is like, you know, putting your arm into a chainsaw and and your other arm into a wood chipper and then wondering what the fuck just happened. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I remember. All right, I'll have to go read this thing here. That this 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 trace thing is like a run down memory lane for a lot of things. At the TLB, who, who makes this? Who wrote this? Podcast about, fine. Oh, I see. Ah, fine, I'm, I'll, I'll not know. All right, what next? Are we done? It's early. I have a little topic. Yeah. Not little. I have uh, a shirt, by the way. We, we, we haven't forgotten. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I have other shirts. But I, I, I just have that to look forward to. That's fine. Um, well, I, I was just uh, like uh, looking at Scala 3 the last several weeks why I couldn't come here out of conflict. And uh, one of the things they have in there is inlining. Like they have an inline that is guaranteed to inline. I like see inline def. One use case for it is uh, inline val uh, means that it's like a constant. So you can constant fold at compile time. You can propagate down. They can also have an inline parameter so they keep going down. They have singleton types for literals. So like instead of type int, you have more specific like 42. The type 42 is, has only the int 42 in it. So you can just do the type know that it's a compile time constant and constant fold and whatnot, that's one thing. And then um, the inline def is not a hint at the, to the compiler to inline, but actually it will always do it. One of the things it can do is reduce um, ifs, if and elses and uh, matches, if it's compile time constants, it can just get rid of code and uh, make it smaller that way. Um, my thought was like, if you're not doing something like that, then it'd be better to let the, the, the JIT compiler in, decide what's inline. Uh, otherwise it's premature optimization. But the other thing you can do is macros. So I can um, actually, um, an inline def can actually be called a macro that at compile time executes, gets an uh, AST and transforms it and returns it and that gets replaced. You know, like the inline replacement is stuff you, it's like code you wrote. So yeah. that, that, anyway, I thought I'd just mention that and see if anybody any comments about. So I, I claim about. the force inlining is like, should be where I'm gonna use it for like a macro. Whereas the thing that says, I'm gonna hack your IR at, macro time and hand the IR back, I don't want to expose the IR itself because then, then you get baked into being forced to have an IR of a particular form. And then, and then I'm you know too fast, too mutating here. I don't want to go there. But I will let you force inline. I think that's a reasonable plan. Why? Why? Yeah. Because the JIT doesn't always get it right. Hmm. So um, I have a uh, uh, H2O, so so big data computation. I have hot loops, mm -hmm. and the inside of every hot loop, I do breakdowns, virtual calls for for decompression that I badly want to inline. Yeah. But the standard way the JIT goes, he says I have a function call boundary. I have a hot loop that says for I equals one to a million. I have a bunch of V calls that are megamorphic, mm -hmm. but I oh. badly want to get clones of that body for mm -hmm. every different common V call I'm going to make. Oh, so they inline in purpose. So I want the V call overhead to happen at the start before I say I equals one to a million and then say, I have the following five V calls in here. So if, 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 oh, here's one of the 32 versions that has this set of disassemblies in the middle or, or, mm -hmm. or decompression in the middle, the decompression now gets inline. The decompression is all two clocks. The V call is 30 clocks. I get a giant 15 to one speed up for having that much inlining. Yeah, but it's that. not a common inline pattern, and the it's a very aggressive inline pattern. And the JITs currently, <laughs> and you know, the guy that did it, you know, twenty five years later, still don't inline like that. Okay. Yeah, that's why I like the idea of this. Uh, what you mentioned, inline parameter. Uh, if as as long as you keep passing it further, uh, 
it forces it to inline. And that's um, that's a situation what uh, what Cliff describes or something similar where you know that something provides some exact knowledge about the value and you want this to be propagated all the way. Um, yeah, I, I like this idea. But when Scala finds that there, uh, if uh, for the uh, bill example, if there are constants, it will reduce the if expression. It will just eliminate it and evaluate it at compile time. So the same hot loop is being used to run a bunch of different data types that have different compression strategies. So I have one loop inside the body of the loop. It's making a megamorphic call. So I can't, I don't have precise type info yet. So that, that's the different there. I need to have an if outside of the loop that says, if it's this thing, here's a clone of the loop body, but I know it's precise. Else if it's this thing, here's a clone of the loop body, I know it's precise and so on. But since the inlining can work with uh, the macros, you can totally write, I believe, you can totally write the function that will test uh, at compile time, it will expand and it will test which of the megamorphic call and it will generate. And if it doesn't find uh, the exact class, it will fall to all pattern to, to uh, dispatch. Yeah, so right. So, so I'm saying macros will do this. I, I think forced inlining based on the class of a of a parameter will do this. That's what I was looking for. And then you get, you know, effectively you get some instance of breakdown tree with two clones of the loop body according to the types. So it, instead of duplicating the code for each for each of the class, it can it will nest an if checks. And if it doesn't it, find it, it will you, expand. If you you must duplicate the loop bodies except have the different decompression strategies broken out by type or else you lost the goal. Hmm. The goal is I have a hot piece of code and I know it's hot. It has a huge trip count and has megamorphic calls in the middle. Hmm. I have to, the, the, the way you get the performance back is to do the megamorphic checks before the million iter trip count, mm -hmm. right? And then to make as many copies of the loop body as necessary and hotspot right now stops at two. There's a, you know, if I, I, you know, he loves one or two and then he gives it up, but I want to say, no, no, make 30. That's okay. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I guess I do want to stop if he's going to be a million completely unique different bodies every time. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. There's actually, there's a point that says trip counts big enough, runtime's long enough. I'll just pay the JIT every time you enter this loop. First, I will JIT you a private copy for this particular call of this particular loop. And then I'll run it. And you know, trip count gets big enough, that's a payoff. That's a win. Yeah, the key is not doing it to everything. Yes. Yeah, the, yeah, M, the M by M is a pretty big uh, scope. It's big. Out, big. Of, yeah. out of that, so, it's a pretty so sparse sweet. matrix of uh, optimization. There, Which is yeah. why I want the user annotation hint that says, and here would be a really good idea that, to go ahead that's and why, blow that's the why I out. Think, that's why I think you're wrong, but. <laughs> Because, because fundamentally, most people are wrong about what to optimize. I get it. I don't know what to do here, Cameron. I, I can't yeah, go. No, I, 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 I hear you. You want a language that works for you. But the problem is, is when you make a language that works for you, it'll break everyone else because they won't know. How many I, times, how many times have I fixed things by deleting every instance of inline from a C code base? And well, it's, okay. it's shocking. All right. I, I, that hasn't happened so much for me. I, you know, I claim I want to give people enough rope to hang themselves, yeah. but if they if they use the rope correctly, they they'll get a win. But we needed we needed inline in yes. C forty it, it, years ago. Yes, forty and years, then, ago. and it became stale technology. At 30, 30 years ago, it was still arguable because there were still cliffs that that needed it. And twenty years ago, if you found inline, it was a bug. And in fact, 20 years ago, I think GCC turned it off, didn't they? Like that was like 20 years ago. They disabled it by default. I can anyone that. remember? Help me. No, I didn't know it was turned off by default, but I, I know it hasn't been needed for a long time. Right. Because generally speaking, the compiler knows better. Yeah. That, right. It doesn't have, you use a macro when you want to force it and you're not getting it out of the inline. Like the C compilers never have profile data. So there are still things that you want to say inline or don't, and then you end up see guys just use a macro. Hmm. And I'm not <laughs> fond of the macro or a macro or a, a test-driven profile. Yeah. 
the flip side to that is our tools have gotten a lot better at rewriting your code for you to be fast, but our developers have gotten a lot worse at knowing what is fast and what is slow. Yeah. It is very difficult for me to get a sense of speed when I'm writing in most languages because okay. I can't see it and can't feel it. And it just feels like I'm hard, far away from the hardware. How am I going to ever learn to do it? I, I agree. And that's a problem that I have seen for a long time. And I don't know what to do about it. One of the things I want to do is leave at least enough rope out there that people can experiment and see something about what's going on. And maybe they'll get closer to understanding where the performance goes. Yeah, but it's also it, it's also very difficult in a multi-generational, you know, hardware environment to make the right decisions because I, I, you know, I remember carefully hand coding stuff, you know, including some assembly many years ago. And basically every decision I made 10 years later was wrong, even though it was right when I did it because because the relative costs of instructions changed. I mean, SCASB. If you find SCASB in code now, it's wrong. But at a, at a certain point in time, that was the only way to get the performance you needed for yeah. you know for a chunk of memory. Yes, doing a memory operation to save myself twelve cycles is not a good plan anymore. Yeah. Well, Scala for sure needed the inline totally to get rid of the collections hierarchy. So sure, the JIT can do it, but uh, if you're absolutely sure that you inline and jump jump eliminate all the hierarchy. Then in it's the okay. land of H2O for me, some five, six, seven years ago, it did not clean out. I could not make Scala get rid of integer double wrappers in hot outer oh. loops, no matter how fucking hard I tried, including every specialized and inline keyword on the planet. The rumors I've heard is if you're good, you can get within 2x of what you can get in Java. Yeah, I tried really hard and I got within 2x. And that's what I'm saying. I couldn't get to a, within Java speed. I could get within 2x Java speed it, it's seven always, years ago, trying really hard. And like, where the hell did the other 2x go? Well, it, I believe it depends on uh, the Scala style we write it. If you write it imp imperative like Java, uh, I believe there is almost no performance. I, I wrote it according to everything I could see on the Scala boards about getting down to the metal. I, I have, I, I did a canonical obvious test case for H2O. It's big data. It's a big array. I'm going to run through the array. I'm going to load something out of the array element one and two. I'm going to add them and store into three. It's like the stupidest possible thing on the planet. I could not get within 2x of, of Java. And I, you know, and I wasn't doing any fucking tricks yet. And that was when I was like, okay, you know. I, this is the state of Scala now. With now I know. inlining and macros, we should try again. Yeah, it could be. You know, it's been a while. You know, seven years long enough. Mm. Could, could uh, totally yeah. be. I, I, it's, it's totally my opinion that the Scala macros uh, and the inlining are to, uh, pretty powerful concept, and, and the macros in Scala basically give you uh, all the power you can get from a macros like this. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I said, I'm not I'm doing H2O right now, so I'm, I'm not trying it at the moment. Um, back then, I tried really hard to give you the Scala Rebel experience over H2O. And the first step was go make these inner loops run fast. And I couldn't get within 2x. Hmm. Sucked. <laughs> All right. Are we dead with that one? <laughs> Next topic. Bill, Bill, you well, you got your question, you got your comment answered. Oh, I just wanted to hear the conversation. That was very interesting. Yeah, okay. I have one that's sort of coming at it sideways. Yeah. Essentially, every SQL database that I've ever worked with, people have added constraints. I have this data integrity thing that needs to be changed over there. And essentially, no programming language I've ever worked in had any kind of data constraints of every time this thing gets updated, that thing needs to be refreshed. Like, what is the difference here that our type systems in SQL have all these constraints and our type systems in our programming languages don't seem to have a concept of like, this list better contain something that is a key in this map over here. Well, I think there's a real world problem that they're trying to solve. 
I, I have this belief that I have a list of the, everyone in my company and their departments and the departments actually exist. And I make changes rapidly and to the data and I make changes rapidly to the program. And because the program is under rapid change, the typings that go with the program is under rapid change. So I want to somehow have my data typed, my permanent store data typed. And then that turns into, you know, I could write a program that's wrong and it changes the data types in the in the in the database. Separately, I want that database to not break and have a higher level semantic type, but I don't have any way to express that in the database itself, that this column is not just persons with a table layout, but it's whatever class person in some mathematical type of the universe. So the table changes what it contains and then I've lost some invariant with some other table over here and I don't have any cross between them going on that I could express or hold on to and then I'm now confused I get my, my data it's a pretty hard barrier you could imagine a language where you would say something like create enum the users table yeah this enum better be a value that is actually an integer in the user IDs list. Right, right. And then the the you have a, a remote execution coming at you as an SQL query to and going back. So the SQL queries have to all be strongly type checkable that way as well. Sure. So, so maybe that's the right answer that there there should exist. I mean, I, I worked for you know a year ago. I worked for a database company that was exactly trying to change how SQL was perceived and used and whatever, because you want to do something more clever in terms of the language typing semantics and whatever. I think you start from the seventies and say, what was the source? What was the order of typings and type systems there? The languages weren't strongly typed, not in the way that we consider them today. You had C. So you wanted to have a strongly typed data separate from any programming language. And then you had an access to and it. I think even now we type our data more strongly than we do our programming languages. Uh, uh, just to just to be uh, the, the, that guy, C yeah. was not strongly typed. C was statically typed. Sure. Yeah. So so and uh, and weakly, statically weakly typed. Right. Yes. Exactly. And the database was in theory statically typed when the when the db admin like put it together but in practice it kept changing over time as well somebody came along and said oh i need to actually break apart you know i, I need to carry male female transgender I, I, it was you know yes white i've seen race. many things that were once a boolean become an enum yeah right now i have black oh i have asian american and well, at, pan, any, at any given point in time it's statically typed yeah yes and it, or even just employee status. You no, are active or you are passive. And suddenly you realize that bullying is not acceptable. You need to have the person who is in the process of being onboarded and the person who's in the process of being offboarded, and hmm. the contractor. And, right, and right. Everything can see he implicitly converts to an integer. So at some point they came up with this concept of I'll run some assertion checking every time you store something into the database. And, and they did and the that, same thing with languages. Isn't that what Eiffel was all about? Uh, Bill, do you remember? Was it Eiffel that had the pre contracts Eiffel. and the post contracts? Yeah. yeah, it was Eiffel. Eiffel. I don't know. Yeah. It was Eiffel. I don't yeah, know. Only four about. people yeah, used it, so it was even smaller than small talk. I thought the tower for the languages was Babel, not Eiffel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Keith, what did you say? Yeah, it had preconditions and post conditions sort of baked in as you know, you could express the contracts for a method or a class. But um, this they this are bake it as a runtime assertion. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so what the words they use were or uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. They use the word require for preconditions and ensure for post conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, the the these conditions are checked at runtime. So what a refined type system would give you, if the type is known, it will known statically at compile time but if it doesn't know it has to propagate as a runtime check because there is no other way so that's a, a refinement type system would give you i mean also, you can imagine that the compiler you know would evaluate, evaluate some of these things at uh, compile time and, mm -hmm. and omit code for them at runtime yeah. 
Yeah. You had this, you would look for invariants like the data is sorted coming in, it's sorted coming out, and I deleted an element in the middle and I kept it sorted. There you go. Mm -hmm. Software construction. It sounds like Eiffel. I can't see yeah. object oriented software construction, but it doesn't say, oh, error is Burn Tree Mayor. I forgot what that name well, yeah. is. That, that was the same era. era. Same, the same era. Yeah. So we actually used Eiffel way back at, at Cognos a long time ago. And I was sort of at the top of the food chain in terms of the, the product structure. And so I was building a component that you know integrated a bunch of other things. And the fundamental flaw that you know made it a kind of a non-starter is that they, had a, uh, they implemented the class hierarchy as a matrix, right? So it was a quadratic, you know, so the size of your program uh, square, uh, you know, grows with the square of the number of classes you have. And so way back, I had you know machine with four megs of memory. And so a thousand classes was too much. Oh, yeah. OK. Well, they had some quadratic implementation detail, because classes are usually like tree structured. Yeah, no, I mean, it had multiple inheritance. And this was their, their it was just an implementation detail. We could probably fix that. Right. Um, but. Um, yeah, so for dispatching, I think, you know, they'd use, you know, the, the index of the, and the index was comp computed kind of at link time of your application. The index of this class, uh, you, you know, you pick the row of that matrix based on it, and then the column is the class that defines the method you want to call, and, you know, there's something there that you use to do that dispatch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, data, you know, the space, uh, the amount of memory consumed for this table was bigger than everything else in this application. <laughs> so it was just silly. Yeah. In implementation details matter. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. It had a similar thing where it maintained a bit matrix of for every commit that's ever been committed, is it downstream of every other commit that has ever been committed? So that it could do these fast checks as it was doing polls, which worked great, except for like three users who had 4,000 developers and 8 million commits. And suddenly the. They had the to replace this whole structure with like run length encoding stuff to make sure that it didn't become this giant bit matrix. Blew out on you. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, quadratic with the number of commits isn't so bad if it's one bit, unless there's a lot of commits. Oh, Hotspot had a lot of commits. I imagine Cameron, your Tangosol or whatever had, as soon as you get a team of 20, 30 guys, Hotspot at 70, working on the same code base for 20 years, you get fucking get a lot of commits. Yeah, I remember recently, I mean, our project, uh, as a fork of the open JDK repos. And but we filtered out all the hotspot stuff that we don't want to see. And when open JDK migrated from Mercurial to, to GitHub, everything changed. And so, you know, you know, a one day uh, in one day, you know, we sucked in 10,000 different commits down this different branch because you know all the commit messages changed. And so they all have different hashes and it's just a mess. So yeah, 10,000 or, you know, tens of thousands of commits is not a big project. Yeah, let's stack up. All right. Looks like we're getting all quiet here. Yeah, I'm not doing much language stuff these days. I'm working on, I'm working on async IO implementation. Excellent. <laughs> It's actually pretty fun. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> I ended up doing a lot of that too. Well, I shot you. I shot you some links a while back of the uh, the crypto stuff. You yeah, know. yeah. I That's thought Go did a pretty good job of doing both async I/O and presenting it to the user as if you were just a normal blocking read, so that I didn't have to have the mental overhead of the asynchronous behavior. Never did Go in anger. Did a lot of JavaScript in anger. 
Yeah, so the model we have is with fibers, you know, each fiber can do its own blocking IO, uh, but the but the underlying the underlying mechanism is all async. So that sounds very similar to the way Go thinks about it. Well, are you implementing Go and Go? Or are you not implementing Go and Go because you can't do async IO at Go? You can't build it in Go. Right. So Cameron, what are you building your async IO in? Uh, well, the prototype's all Java. Oh gosh. Okay, fine. So I'm using I'm using the DNIO, the non-blocking APIs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, fine. So, so speaking of the underlying things, I had a chuckle at your comment that I noticed in GitHub recently. You quote Mark as saying, Oh, it's there's ducks underneath all the turtles or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we actually just introduced project uh, a new a new library called Mac, M A C K, because it's the bottom turtle. So if you've ever read Yertle the Turtle, the name of the turtle on the bottom of the stack is is Mac. Mac. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. And there there was a humorous comment, and I'll see if I can find it. I'll, I'll post it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to claim we're winding down here, and it's been close to two hours. So until we meet again, any any last comments here? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull plug. Like. Yeah, right. thanks for letting me in. Yep, you'll get invites for a while. We can come again. It's all good. I will. All right, see people next week. Yeah, everybody. Bye, right. right, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.